You've been in all those countries and on all those interviews in 31 days. Yeah, but I guess it's like, it's, uh, you know, the film is in itself a sort of, a, you know, in practice of the philosophy of uh, Arendt in a way. So, you know, she's talking about thinking in action. And I think the idea was a bit to take the, the process as a film as also the writing of, you know, of, of her philosophy at some level. So if she's talking about practice in action, like, you know, and thinking in action, then what does it look like if you were to put it in a film? So, you know, we, it was really clear to me that it had to be done and it had to be done in sort of a, this kind of non-linear format that would be kind of dictated by each of the different, you know, contributors and each of the different, um, you know, uh, people that will come in and out. And I think, you know, the reason why I started the movie to some level, and I'm really happy to see that there is actually one of the students of the University of the Underground there. Yes, Tom Burke. Yes, you represent the team, the crew. But I think, you know, the film really started as well because to some level, I, you know, at the University of the Underground, we talk a lot about putting thinking into action. And I think this is kind of like the most probably difficult thing to do at some level. Like, you know, you can have like a, a clear idea of what action you want to develop, but then it would take a lot of iteration. It would take a lot of, you know, thoughts and you don't really know what sort of process you need to put in place. And I felt that maybe Anna and, you know, aren't at the answer at some level. So maybe that was a way to actually bring that answer back to the students. And actually, if during these 31 days, which is pretty much like the kind of summer break, I could kind of crack it, then, you know, I would be maybe a better teacher. But I don't know. That, who knows? Um, how much of the structure did you have in place um, before you started filming? How much of the structure were in place? Well, I had all of the questions. I guess you can feel it in the film. There are so many different layers to it. Like, I had tons of questions. Uh, and we had, of course, all of this, um, you know, all of this... Uh, contributor to the movie and all these different places where we wanted to go and meet and but I guess you know some some of the elements we had like of course the books the writing and you know the students and so forth but then beyond that like I kind of left them again like guide the and kind of lead the way and I love that you know at some point when I met with the um uh, the hypnotherapist, you know, the kind of the idea that she kind of like open up all of these different gates. And then when uh, Richard was talking about, you know, the idea that thinking is like this kind of uh, thread that you have to also unpack and let kind of happen. And, you know, and I think this film is also that, like, and I think he has this complete non-linear format, but then at the same time you have, you know, all of these uh, different contributors also musically that kind of join the project. Uh, and so, yeah, to your point, I guess the, the film and the structure in my head perhaps were as clear as the chapters of the books. And then at the end of the day, it became completely messy, completely chaotic, and the, the actual editing process was completely chaotic. And also, like, the filming was completely chaotic. I mean, at some point, I had a suitcase. I lost my suitcase. I had all of the kit and all of the props, you know, of Anna Arendt, all of the clothes. And then I arrived in Ethiopia, and it's all missing. And, you know, and then we lost the camera, and then we found the camera, and then we lose the sound, and then we found the sound. And then, you know, and then from one place to the other, then we ended up in Lasco. I didn't want it to go to Lasco. I wanted to go to the other cave. Anyway, everything kind of like became this, you know, kind of big mess to some level. And I, and to some level, yeah, I don't know if we found the origin of knowledge, but uh, clearly we, to some level, found that actually perhaps if there is no answer, like at least there is like multiple different viewpoints as to how we can put uh, thinking into action. Um, I think it's quite interesting as well. That, um, you, I think they touched on it in, in the film, um, the, um, the friends of Hannah, that virtually that um, she had a very kind of Western perspective. Um, how important was it for you that kind of, you visited countries in Africa um, and Asia, so Ethiopia and Japan? Yeah, I mean, actually, this is one thing that was quite clear from the beginning, is like I knew that Arendt was, you know, pretty much has never travel. I mean, she had to travel because, of, co of course, you know, she uh, survived uh, the Second World War. She escaped in France. Then in France, eventually took a boat, got into New York. Then eventually traveled to Israel to cover the Eichmann, uh, Eichmann sorry, uh, trial, court case, and then wrote about it for the New Yorker, then came back. But then beyond that, she never really traveled. And that, to me, was a real issue. Like, how can you become this philosopher that is kind of looked upon as being someone that has been investigating and talked about, you know, the origin of totalitarianism and actually have never really been 
beyond you know the kind of the the western uh, field and so i really wanted to kind of like bring her in all these different places i mean obviously it's a it's a metaphor because it's not like if i really bought her there but right now she's in turkey for example so she got a full insight into um, another form of totalitarianism regime i guess she's stuck there for a while in a museum um, you said you just said um, that you had um, quite a kind of complex um, um, editing process. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, well, I mean, the editing process was very much uh, so. David Potter and I were like again, like it was also part of the choice that I wanted it to be edited. In, like, yeah. So the students uh, actually it wasn't. Yeah, when did you finish? No, you you were already graduating, I think, at this point. Oh no, when did I do? No. You weren't graduating at this point. You graduated the year after. So I guess I was like, uh, yeah, I was kind of like pressed by the start of their school year. So then it just meant that, you know, we had to finish it in basically 10 days. So we editing the entire movie in 10 days. But I think to be honest, like we spoke about it a long time with uh, David now because we waited a year you know, the way it works in films as well, there is all this politics. So, you know, you apply for this film festival and then eventually you really want to make your premiere in a film festival. So you have to sit on this film until the world premiere kind of take place. So it took a year to actually come out with the film. But we, so we had multiple occasions to rework the movie, but we decided not to do it because I think like for me, it really is uh, that kind of raw, um, you know, thought process, that raw practice. Uh, and I want to keep it this way. I think in, um, that's reflected also um, in the, um, the the movie itself. I mean, you can have a lot of it. You mean as, you, as we all saw, there's you know there's people walking in the background. There's lots of kind of noise, and, and that's I mean, that's intentional. It's going to keep that all in to the film. Well, I mean, there is that, and there is also the kind of the reality of the movie. I mean, again, there is like so many different layers to the movie. I guess it can be really annoying for some because you think like, okay, what is the starting point, at the end of this story? But then at the same time, I start to see more and more the value of like this nonlinear format. Um, you know, we uh, there is a whole section about water as well, and uh, you know, of course, uh, the machine, the water machine, the economics, and so forth, and the idea that it's sort of like this never-ending process to to think and to. Um, and so to, sorry, to your question, I missed it. <laughs> <laughs> I was just, um, how in many sequences there's that you actually do have kind of, you know, there's um, other yeah. staff, you know, they're yeah. the background, they're working, you know, someone's mopping the floor, you know, there's, you kept that all in. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess this, the reality of the, you know, of doing a documentary, these things are not being staged, it just happened. Uh, and so you can decide to make a very sick documentary, but then for me it's also, you know, I come from this, quite uh, perhaps, uh, you know, maybe old school, like cinema verite, like I really value the idea that you, you know, you have a camera rolling and then it just happens. Now it's a fact that perhaps if I was to redo it, I would choose different camera operator. Not to say, but you know, the best uh, shots were actually shot by a woman. Fiona Braillon was my director of photography and she wasn't able to follow me throughout the entire journey because, you know, of course, so many different cities and so forth. So the best shots were the one by Fiona and actually the one where Fidgety is usually men holding cameras. But that, I'm not going to, you know, give any, any truth there. Like you all know that men don't know how to hold a camera. I guess that's like, a, again, a proof by action, you know, that's the, in this film. Um, you talk a lot about, um, a lot about kind of um, non-linear. Non I mean, is, is that kind of always your approach to projects and your work? Well, the new movie actually that we are working on called Red Gold is again like really pushing this even further. This kind of non-linear format. I mean, this is a story of four. Uh, families basically, but they are all doppelganger of each other and they all tell the story of each other basically at different place. There's, and there's more doppelgangers because you actually oh, have doppelgangers as well. Yeah, I have two doppelgangers, but these ones will not be the story of my doppelgangers. That will be these families' uh, doppelgangers um, and they will be like investigating basically stories of, you know, colonialism, traumas around colonialism uh, and also talking about, you know, the future plans of colonizing the moon basically. And so all of these families are connected through the cable under the ocean. So they all are actually uh, deep divers. It's a pretty bonkers movie, <laughs> is all I can say. So, uh, yeah. Great. <laughs> um, I mean, something that was kind of, you talked a little about kind of um, knowledge, of, but also it kind of lends itself to kind of truth and kind of what you especially kind of measure at the start was saying how he kind of had gained a lot of his knowledge from the internet and he saw this as kind of you know his um his education learning i think i think 
this year and kind of the era that we're in, people are looking a lot at kind of like fake news, kind of deep fakes, you know. How does that fit into kind of this knowledge base and what we question to be the truth? I mean, you're asking me this, what we just have learned the result of the election, I think. Um, uh, how does the internet play a role in truth? I mean, I guess it's, uh, again, like this is another movie perhaps that needs to be done about like the actual like power of media and internet into actually shaping opinion and thought process. And, uh, and, I, and to some level, I think what Majid is talking about is talking about the role of the internet in, of course, like delivering universal form of knowledge and access to knowledge, which is true. Uh, but then, of course, there is then the other side of the story, which is, of course, the stakeholder of the internet, Google and so forth, and how data are being contained and how data are being manipulated and how perhaps then we have to also rely back to actually the kind of our you know, our critical thoughts and what is in our brain, which is also the reason why I really wanted to go back to the very beginning, like, you know, Neanderthal and Lucy and so forth, to so actually really try to actually understand before even the internet, like, how did we think? How did we form critical thinking? Uh, and, um, and, and, you know, whether BPD had a role to play in that, whether economics had a role to play in that. I mean, I kind of touch upon it quite a lot and quite heavily, actually, in the movie. But, you know, there is this obviously belief that uh, knowledge can of also come with trade and the need to exchange and, you know, and economics. Uh, and so economics is also a big word, you know, like we tend in education and in other places to try and stay away from it or politics or, but for me, it's actually completely um, like you, you, in order to, to shape knowledge and so forth, you need economics. You need to actually make them a part of the, the knowledge base. So you can either decide to leave others, take the lead on that, or you can make your own form economics as well as your own form of knowledge and so forth. So I guess the, the movie, and I hope, it's clear, I don't know if it is, you know, I think it's like, obviously it's the third time we are showing the movie. So uh, it's like, a, you know, it's like giving birth, like you take some time to actually like look at the thing and the kind of like conciliate with that uh, thing that has happened there. Uh, but I guess the, what the film is saying in a quite positive manner is to some level, if you're not satisfied with uh, what you see in the world, if you actually find that there is a monster, if you find that uh, you don't uh, really reconciliate with certain form of truth, then perhaps the answer is not to just close off and kind of like isolate yourself from these realities and others' realities, but perhaps engage in a dialogue and actually build platforms for plurality to take place. I think that's, uh, that's what I hope uh, the movie will um, kind of give away and I hope to, to see, especially now, that we have the result of the election. So beyond the disappointment that we probably all feel right now, I think there is also the idea that, you know, there is nothing that is set in stones and there is ways that we can actually reconciliate and rework systems. And perhaps what we see right now with the election is just, again, a demonstration that these systems do not uh, reconciliate. I mean, they, they, they perhaps are, are dead or they need to be dead. And then at that point, we need to start building new form of politics. Um, this is also um, leading to kind of the work you do with the University of the Underground and your students that you have. How? Does this, um, does this lead into kind of, you know, the, yeah. kind of the whole school of thought and then university that you've set up? Yeah, I guess, uh, I mean, I guess the university also come from that thought process for sure. Uh, and, you know, the idea that I wasn't satisfied with the way that uh, education at least was set up. So I wanted to test out perhaps uh, another model. Uh, and I guess what I love to see now is like, you know, we are three years in existence and now little by little, you know, things have changed, uh, things are developing, like, of course, different viewpoints arrived, you know, of course, the students have, have their own views. I mean, I don't know, Tom, do you want to say something or you just want to hide in the back and feel depressed about the result of the election? I think... Nelly was 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 uh, trying to make something that was going to be uh, kind of uh, challenging and, and possibly a new experience for people, and that resulted in, um, you know, some people really engaged with it, some people completely disengaged, some people loved it, some people hated it, and you know, um, and I'm I'm sure that's going to continue to be the way it is going forward, and that's that's pretty much the the kind of dialectic you're you're, you're trying to achieve, right? 
Well, I mean, I don't know. I think what I'm trying to say is actually that there is no such thing as, you know, it's black or white to some level. And I, and, yeah. and I guess this is what you're saying. It's complicated. Things are complicated. Knowledge is complicated. But for sure, there is one thing that is for certain is like you just don't want knowledge to be just hold in the hands of, you know, one person or a few person. Like it has to kind of spread out and actually have multiple different stakeholders. I guess that's the, that's the answer. I mean, that's the answer, that's what is being said there. And all of them have a different approach as well to what knowledge is. Like if you think about I, uh, Hiroshi, you know, he thinks that knowledge actually started with artificial intelligence. So it's a very recent uh, production compared to someone like uh, Chomsky, for example, that, you know, go back all the way to the cave and, uh, and kind of like connect it back to environments and, you know, planet Earth even. Yeah, so we are based in the basement of Nightclub, and it was started in 2017, so set as a charity. Uh, and so we do different things, you know, we have the master program, there is a research program. Now we, we've just announced, actually, yesterday we are opening a high school for 10 to 16. And, you know, you learn music, film design, politics, uh, political theory, linguistics, uh, and all of this in the context of the production of an event or an expense that is going to be actioned in, within, you know, an institution and in collaboration with an institution, basically. The idea being that this event is going to trigger and start a conversation with the people that are part of this institution. And are you still in the basement? Still in the basement. We right just repainted it. Um, you know, still there, still going, and now being run by, so the alumni is from the year of Tom, you know, now one of them is actually running the high school of the underground. Uh, and then the research program is now still run by one of the tutors. But the idea is like, you know, at one point, like it will be just basically the students will be also running it and then it will keep on growing like that. Uh, so right now we are also going to go in Georgia, we go in Egypt, you know, and we, this year we are investigating like going in different basically places and kind of questioning this idea of transnational education that Arjun Apadurai, the latest, uh, the last contributor, talk about. You know, this idea of like, can you actually like go and take education everywhere and kind of be on, you know, kind of colonialistic um, uh, approach and actually try to think about it more in a globalized uh, manner. So that's basically what we are testing and experimenting with this year. The music was actually also part of the whole process of the film because, so as part of the process, I went to meet with uh, this record label in Brooklyn called RGVN International, which is producing, you know, a lot of independent uh, electro musicians, LGBTQ plus and so forth. And so um, I met with the, the, I can't remember his name, oh dear, uh, who is running the label. And then we were talking, and then as we were talking, it was, pass you know, playing some records. Uh, and then at that point, I just pick up uh, a book, and then that was actually a book that they just made about the, some of the artists. And in there, there was Lucretia Dalt, who is a woman that is singing this song about the monsters extruding the eyes and the eyeball and all of that. And so Lucrecia was on our roster, and she actually just composed a whole uh, new album, which was called On the Edge, uh, which actually had the, this whole kind of debate and discussion with a monster from Amazonia and uh, from Colombia. I can't remember the name of the monster, unfortunately. Uh, but she had, a, and the whole actually uh, soundtrack is about that, like conversing with this monster. So then I went to meet her in Berlin and then also engage with her. Like, I mean, we did a whole interview as well with her. Eventually, we didn't put that whole section inside the, the movie because, you know, we kind of decided not to actually speak about knowledge and go down record, but actually make a record itself, you know. But so that's how it started. And then, of course, then when I was in Ethiopia, you know, because the University of the Underground is also about engaging the nightlife with places of power and actually empowering counterculture to have access to places of power. Uh, then we, you know, obviously when I was in Ethiopia, I went to hang with, you know, the kind of the, like the nightclub and the nightlife that was recommended to me by some friends from Kenya that knew some people in Ethiopia and so forth. And then I found this band, Asmat, who then composed the music uh, and they just really started, um, you know, and, and all the music is really by and Colin Self, uh, who is also from RGVN International. So then that's how it started to shape and then it's all conversation with also all of the, um, all of the artists that compose the music and for me it was essential that also the music kind of give the rhythm to the entire editing. I mean, the way I work as well, and you can see it from my previous film as well, is I always edit with the music. 
So the music is there, we play the record, we are editing with the music, which was kind of unusual for David Potter, mm -hmm. because we had the record player playing at the same time as he was trying to listen to the... Uh, uh, so it's a real experience for him as well. Like, but Was it all on vinyl? Uh, yeah, all on vinyl, yeah. The vinyl, which you will get outside, is the entire soundtrack of uh, the movie. I mean, you don't have the music for RGVN International because, you know, I would rather have you buy their record. So that's a call for you to support as well independent uh, musicians. But I'd say to you, um, inside the vinyl, you have at least all of the interview. And also because it's a movie with so many different contributors, you know, you might need a bit more time to kind of like maybe re-listen to that guy or that guy or that guy, then or this person, you know, and then you can do that with a record basically. And the idea as well being that the, you know, the vinyl factory is supporting independent filmmakers to actually produce experimental content. And the idea we thought was to, because no distributor wanted to take my movie because it's kind of appealing to, you know, more of an academic audience, but at the same time, it's quite a fresh, you know, like a, like, you know, the, it just doesn't fit their kind of academic audience either. Uh, so it's just a, a fucking pain to sell a movie like this. <laughs> so nobody wanted, it's too risky. So then I, so then I went to the Vinny factory and I thought, will you take that movie? And then they were like, we never took a movie. So then why don't we try it? And the idea being that, of course, you get a free record when you come to the cinema with any ticket you buy. So it kind of like support each other and you can of course get it as well from the vinyl factory. So it's kind of the independent music industry supporting independent filmmaking and vice versa. And that's, so that's the idea behind the, this distribution model basically. And it's working. And it's working. I mean, I wouldn't say that uh, we are making multi-million here, that this uh, fits straight into the University of the Underground, but uh, I'd say, you know, it's, uh, it's working to some level, yeah.